It all started when I was in middle school. My friends and I at that point were experimenting with things like Adderall. So I tried taking some of my sister's Adderall. It did nothing. But I would use that almost as currency to trade with my friends to get the things that I wanted, the things that worked for me, like um, the Percocets, Vicodin, um, Benzos, whatever I could really get my hands on. My friends and I would find prescription drugs in our parents' medicine cabinets. My grandparents lived right next door, so they had a giant medicine cabinet. We would all essentially trade medications that we found, or there were people in school that had them, and over time you just, you get to know who has what, especially in, in eighth grade and transitioning into high school. Um, you know who to ask. My transition through prescription pills happened very quickly. I realized that for me personally, what I was looking for in the drugs, I found in opiates. And I was about 16 when Oxycontin first came around. We all thought that it was still safe. Because it was a prescription medication, because it was FDA approved, because doctors were prescribing it for something, we just didn't care what. Um, we were way past that point. But I began paying 60 to 80 dollars per pill um, of Oxycontin and I was using about five to six Oxycontin pills a day, um, which became a very, very expensive habit uh, for a 16 year old. My drug dealer said, you're, you're spending a lot, an awful lot of money. And then he asked me if I had ever tried heroin. And I was like, I just remember looking at him, this disgusted look on my face, like, I would never do that. Like, how dare you even ask me? And he just looked at me and, and basically told me, well, Oxycontin, are, are, it's pretty much synthetic heroin anyway. Um, why wouldn't you try it? It's cheaper and it's stronger. But it took me a week, a week before I came back and um, asked him if he, if he knew where I could find heroin. And I had no idea um, the consequences that were going to follow. I think one of my friends was telling me, if you just get it right into your blood system, um, you don't waste as much and it hits you faster. Um, so I, was, I just decided I would try it. I ended up overdosing in the back seat, my first time shooting heroin, and I turned purple. I stopped breathing, and because my boyfriend and my drug dealer were too concerned about protecting themselves, um, they wouldn't bring me to a hospital. They brought me into the woods and were essentially leaving me there to die. Um, a woman saw from her window two grown men carrying a lifeless body into the woods and called 911. They tried to give me a shot of Narcan, like an adrenaline, to revive me, and nothing happened. Um, I was essentially pronounced dead. Um, they gave me another shot of Narcan, and I just remember for a split second opening my eyes and seeing everything in the ambulance and just falling right back to sleep. I immediately called my boyfriend, and I said, I'm being released from the hospital. I don't care about the rest of my money, just pick me up with another bag of heroin. And I was off and running like that for a very long time. And becoming an addict became a full-time job for me. And the description that went along with it was lying, cheating, and stealing my way through um, to get what I needed, to get high. And I was never that person growing up. You know, I was... I was that straight-A student, even through high school. I didn't see how quickly I was flushing my life down the drain. Um, but in terms of getting it back, it's been a very, very, very slow process. I was picked up and I was arrested um, for an, another domestic assault and battery charge. It was my 10th. Once I showed up for court, it was a long weekend, so I was, I was held in a cell for, I think, three days. And I showed up to court, and I was shackled to this woman who was probably 50, 60 years old. She stunk like booze. 
And I just remember having one of those epiphanies that it was like, that's, that's, that's gonna be me. Like, that's where I'm heading. I probably used with about 10, 15 people. Five of us are sober, five of them are dead, um, including my ex-boyfriend that left me in the woods. They were never lucky enough to get to the point where they wanted recovery. So they either made the ultimate sacrifice in taking their own lives or um, are still off and running right now um, into their mid-20s, their early 30s, because we were lucky. You know, there's no other way to describe it. I mean, not everyone makes it to the point where they're going to be okay when they come out on the other end.